Welcome back to Financial Matters with Richard Oring. I am John J. Gay. Rich, always great to be with you. It's always great to be here. So today we're going to talk about what a financial planner does and who should be looking to use one. This is so important. You know, that's a great intro for this topic. And just the other day I was talking to my son and he's a competitive um, kart racing. It's what you do if you ever want to try to get into a professional career in racing, you usually cut your teeth in karting. Mm-hmm. And these aren't like your little go-karts you see down the street. These things are going 60, 80 miles an hour. These aren't soapboxes. Got it. No, nah, it's crazy. Um, if you ever um, YouTube my last name, his, his first name is Ethan, you'll see this um, crash. And as a parent, you, your heart just drops and you're freaking out. It gets thrown. Up. There's no seatbelts on these cards, by the way. Yeah. So it was one of his first races and he just flew out. Everyone was like shocked. We thought the ambulance was going to go on the track. And he got up, thumbs up, and an hour later got back on the track. I was impressed. But anyway, one thing I've learned from racing is you can't do it on your own. Yeah. You need a coach. So Ethan's part of a team, and there's some experienced drivers on the team, and they coach the, the newer drivers. And there's a captain, an owner of the team, who happens to be the national driver, won the national driver of the year nice. last year. He's been racing since he was a little kid. He probably could go pro, but it's not what he wants to do for a career. Mm -hmm. But he has a coach. He actually has two coaches in racing. So after a race day or race weekend, one of the coaches and he do a Zoom meeting and they analyze the the video, you know, step by step for a few hours and looking to see um, what he could do differently. You know, with the technology now, you can see where you're accelerating, where you're braking too fast, what kind of lines you're taking. You can overlap someone else's lines on top. Wow. It, it truly is amazing, but he has, he has that coach who does it. And then he has the team captain who's another coach and he's there teaching him, you know, the same things, but as a driver and probably more technical. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I probably should have a third coach who actually owns an F4 team, which is like the minor leagues of F1. Mm-hmm. And he's been coaching Ethan on the business side of racing, like how to get sponsors, how do you get from karting to F4 and, and things like that. Wow. So we all have had coaches in our lives. If you played sports, you had a coach. Look, you can have natural talent. Natural talent by itself does not make you a pro, though. Tom Brady, Bill Belichick, understood, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even Tiger Woods has a swing coach, you know? So we have life coaches. Some people see therapists for some coaching for themselves. Some people have business coaches, professional coaches family members who guide you or friends guide you in tough decisions in life or hard times in life. So I think we're all used to having a coach and a financial planner is a coach. Right. You know, we can come up with the greatest plans in the world. We can come up with the greatest recommendations, but the player, the client has to still execute and perform the best and follow through what we teach them. That is so true in so many different things. Um, And even when I was a radio DJ, I had some great coaches in that space too, who It's funny you talk about your son, Ethan, because the analogy of this old radio mentor of mine gave me is that doing a radio show or a podcast is like driving a race car. You do all your work in the pit so that when the race starts, all you've got to do is drive. So prep and understanding and executing and all of that. Rich, I got to tell you, over the last few years, I have a lot of friends I've seen on social media just in passing looking for referrals for financial advisors. Why do you think this is trending that more people are looking for financial advice here in 2021? Wow, that's a great question. I think there's a lot of different reasons. You know, just recently I read an, an article um, CNBC actually came out with, I found it online. They did a survey in 2019. And what was interesting, that survey showed that only 1% of American adults actually use a financial planner. Wow. Now, I, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, wow, that's really low percentage. I know a lot of people who use, you know, investment guys and things like that with Merrill Lynch or an independent advisor like myself. But that's not a financial planner. That's someone you went to, you had a 401k, you wanted to roll it over, you didn't want to invest the money yourself, so you hired someone to manage your investments. That's not what a financial planner is. Someone, you know, financial planner is, um, can do the investments, but they're usually documenting a plan for you, you know, for retirement, looks at your taxes and things like that. We'll go over that probably later on. Goes back to the coach thing. Yeah. So I think um, one of the reasons we, we see a lot more of this is that we see a lot of more TV commercials. You know, <laughs> I mean, honestly, you turn on the TV now and you got big corporations in the investment world offering financial planning because they know if they don't offer the financial planning, they might also lose the investments. That's where it's going. That's where the industry's trending, yeah. Correct. 
especially with the robo advisors out there, you know, the robo advisors can't replace a human doing planning. Yes. They might be able to do low cost investing, but they can't give you the planning advice, making wise decisions with your money. They can give you some wizards and templates to use to help you, but it doesn't replace a professional one-on-one conversation about your particular needs. So we've talked about this before, Rich, that so much of what you do is uh, psychology and the psychology of investing. And an algorithm is not going to take into account your pain points or your fears or your wants or your desires or your long-term plans of what you want to do with your money in your life. So that human touch is just so important. Exactly. And I think it's interesting. Like when we see more financial planning clients coming, like you, you mentioned the social media. On the social media, I've also noticed um, an increase of people asking for referrals. I live in Yardley and there's a, um, a page called Great Place to Live in Lower McField Township. Mm-hmm. And I think every week someone's posting anyone have a good financial advisor they can recommend? And I get a little blurb that someone, you know, mentioned my name and I, you know, go out and thank them and I introduce myself. But it's interesting, like the younger clientele now who are going to advisors, a lot of it has to do with debt planning, hmm. which is interesting. Or they want to get to the next level of their life. Like, hey, okay, we got college taken care of. We got our house. We're doing this. But we want to make sure, you know, we're 45 we only got 20 more years or 27 more years of working. We can't make mistakes. We're, we're focused. And maybe that people are working at home right now. Maybe they're looking at their expenses, their savings a little bit closer. Maybe couples are having conversations. Maybe that's sparking the conversation to go out and hire an advisor. You know, a lot of times what I see is that one person in the household handles the finances. And that's great for so many years. And then eventually the other spouse is one or two things going to happen. They're going to want to get involved because maybe they think they should be in a better situation or they don't really know what's going on. And, or maybe the assets have grown so much that they don't trust their other, their spouse to completely manage that. Well, it's funny. You're, you're kind of preaching to the choir there because, you know, my wife works in corporate finance, so she handles the bulk of the finances in the house here. But but we have conversations and we I think we've got a pretty good uh, open, you know, com- line of communication between each other with it. But we think about we've both been working from home for over a year now with the pandemic. And we were looking at, you know, as we were doing our taxes for 2020, like, OK, well, we did not spend X amount of dollars on trips this year because we didn't go anywhere. Okay, so we weren't expecting to have this money at the end of the year. We would have spent this on travel. What do we do with this money? Is there something we've been wanting to purchase for the house? Do we invest it? And we've had these conversations in light of the events of the last year. Correct. And probably now you're also having conversations not just about how to to spend the money you saved last year, which was an article in the newspaper just the other day warning people not to splurge and adjust their um, budget based on last year's numbers. That's good advice. Yeah. But- you might have also had time to really focus on what you want in life and where mm-hmm. you want to be when you retire. Cause you know, now you have more time together to have these conversations. It's not like you're running off to work. She's running off to work. You come home, you're talking about your day, you're having dinner, then you're plopping down, watching TV on the couch. Right. And then falling asleep. Although I will say we do work at opposite ends of the house, which is good that we're not in the same room 24 seven, probably mainly for her sake. So I'm not driving her crazy, but, <laughs> but you know, we'll have five minute conversations throughout the day as we sort of pass each other in the kitchen or whatever it is. But we have our separate workspaces during the day. And then at night we have dinner together. We walk the dog, we watch TV and we go to bed. So there is something to be said for that, but you're right. There is not having that hectic of, You know, I'll see you for two seconds in the morning and then when you get home for an hour, watch TV and go to bed. So you guys got a new dog? Yeah, we got a, uh, we got her about a year ago. We got a, uh, we got, we got Miss Jules uh, Easter or so last year. So actually her gotcha day was this past weekend. So what kind of dog? She is a lab mix. She is seven and she's got a lot of personality and, uh, and she's a lot of fun. So, um, so we're, we're, we're really happy with her. Labs have a lot of energy. We have a uh, we have three dogs. We have a Labradoodle. We have a Chocolate Lab and a, a small little mix. My Chocolate Lab is the laziest dog ever since a puppy. <laughs> and during COVID, he had um, two hip replacements. Oh, jeez! <laughs> so it was birth defect. And then my Labradoodle is the most hyper dog. And thank God she's getting older and beginning to calm down. But she's a Labradoodle, and they're very intelligent. And when you're very intelligent, you kind of do what you want to do. <laughs> Yeah, they have a way of outsmarting the owner sometimes. No offense. I ask her to do something. She looks at me, thinks about it, and just walks away. (laughs) That looks like having another kid, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yep. 
So we talked about a few reasons why um, we, we're seeing it. And there's probably a lot of other reasons, too, you know, why people are uh, more aware what, you know, there's financial advisors out there asking for referrals. We, you know, I mentioned the younger um, adults are probably the newest clientele coming for advice. Mm -hmm. But don't forget the baby boomers. Right. It's been a few years now. Baby boomers started retiring. There was a um, an article from Pew um, Research Center. They came out an article not too long ago. But the third quarter of 2020, they saw a humongous increase in retirees in the baby boomer category. Mm -hmm. And their feeling is that probably logically would say because of COVID and a lot of businesses had to scale back and things like that, that these baby boomers who might have been at the highest pay scale might have been let go, forced into retirement. So when you're forced into retirement, even if you created your, your ideal financial plan for retirement, that just is coming a lot sooner. Yeah. So people are, you know, seeking advice like, hey, you know, I got to retire or, you know, I've had clients now in their late 50s looking to retire. I had a new client come in just the other day. She was 60 and she wanted to retire. And I had to explain to her, I need two more years of you working because the medical costs and she, you know, would cost a lot and things like that. Right. And then the last thing is there's been a lot of tax code changes over the last couple of years. And again, we, we talked about this in one of the first episodes, what you expect when you hire someone. And if you remember, I mentioned that when you hire an accountant to do your tax return, they're there to prepare a tax return. They're not there to give you tax advice always. Right. So they're preparing a return, delivering it to you. Wow, I owe money. What's going on? They'll answer it, but... You know, they might say this is the reason. They'll just throw a few reasons out. I mean, don't forget, they're swamped doing tax returns. Right. They're not going to sit down with you and analyze your tax return and go over um, how you can change to reduce your tax. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, those are probably the biggest reasons right now why I personally feel that people are asking for referrals. They're seeking professional advice, that coach strategy to help. So I know a lot of folks are uh, coming to financial planners because. It might not be as expensive as they thought it was at one point. What is the price structure for financial planners, Rich? That is one of my um, issues in our industry. I mean, a financial plan does take a lot of time. Yeah. It doesn't have to. <laughs> it's usually you start the process and you're waiting for information for the client to give it to you. And you start and stop, start and stop and start and stop. And then you kind of lose interest pushing the client too much. So... If you're upfront with the client and you tell them, like, look, this is the process. I need you to be committed before you start the process with us. Mm -hmm. You know, I can bring the pricing down. But the traditional way for, you know, financial plans were for the wealthy. Yeah. You know, in the past when the estate tax was like $5 million limit and things like that. And they have to create these trusts and gifting strategies and all this kind of fun stuff. But that's totally changed now. I mean, I think everyone could use a financial planner to help. Agreed. So traditionally, a financial planner, you would go there and you would pay them a lump sum. They probably would bill you half up front and then bill the rest at the delivery, the day of delivery. And I've seen plans. I mean, you can get a really inexpensive plan, but I would say it's not quality. Get what you pay for, yeah. Correct. So normally you would be looking at 2000 and I've seen plans over $10,000, you know, easily, hmm. you know, depending on how wealthy. But the average American, I would say, is between two to $10,000, depending on, you know, the location, the zip code, where they live and mm -hmm. everything. Then if, you know, a lot of times people, what they would do is in this kind of planning arrangement is they would pay up front for the one year and they wouldn't do anything for the second, third, fourth year. And then they would get it updated. And usually when you get one updated, it's not as expensive. Sure. It might be two thirds the cost, one half of the cost, uh, because there's not as much input, you know, to start the plan. Got it. So that's the traditional way. You probably will see more of that than anything else still to this day. Mm -hmm. Then you got the AUM model, assets under management. You know, there's fee-only advisors. They're going to charge you to manage assets. We don't have to manage your assets, but we're not going to charge you any, we're not going to say any commission products, nothing. You're going to come in, we're going to do your financial plan, and we're going to charge you a couple basis points, anywhere basis points is percentages. Okay. Um, we're going to charge anywhere between a quarter percent to a percent based on your assets, your AUM. 
So some companies calculate that differently. Some will say it's your vestible assets. Some will say that would be usually on the higher percentage rate. Other people will say all your properties. If you have a house, a rental property, your 401k, everything. There you go. AUM, assets under management. So you're saying it for 1%, just for the sake of keeping the math simple here, if you've got $100,000 in assets, you're going to pay them $1,000 to manage that. They might not even take that as a client for $1,000. Now, let's just say, though, they don't do it that way. Let's say they do it a quarter percent and they include your house. They include your rental properties. They include everything else. And now you have a million dollars at a quarter percent, 2500 And that would probably be inexpensive, too. Got it. All right. So that's one way of doing it. And they're not going to take your investment accounts and hold it at their firm to manage. What they would usually do is tell you to go to a Schwab or something, and they will give you a buy sell recommendation, you know, when you meet once a year. Okay. You know, maybe twice a year. They'll review the investments and then reallocate based upon where you are today with your goals and your risk and so forth. Then there's a combination of the two. Okay. Where they charge you something upfront. And they also charge you a percentage to manage the assets or either way. It could be the investments or the AUM, everything you own. So that's another way people are doing billing. They can just increase your fees in your investment accounts. So let's just say the average advisor charges 1%. They might come in and say, we're going to manage your investments at 1.5. Okay. Now they have to disclose that and there has to be a contract explaining what, you know, why there's an additional fee and things like that. But that's another way of doing it. The newest way of doing financial planning is the way I like to do it. It's what we call subscription-based planning or the Netflix way of planning. (laughs) Okay. So I believe that planning has to be affordable. Sure. If you come to someone and you tell them it's going to cost them $4,000 to do a financial plan and they're in debt, (laughs) that's a lot of money. Absolutely, yeah. And they don't know, this is their first experience. They don't know what the value of that planning relationship is going to be. So what subscription-based planning does is um, a lot of times there's an upfront fee anywhere between, you know, $750 to $2,000, let's say. I mean, every company is different. Sure. But they want to capture an upfront fee. Sometimes they charge the first year's fees like the traditional way and then start the subscription the second year. So there's a lot of work on the first year. You know, there's input, there's questions, there's really getting to know someone, getting their employee benefit packages, like everything and reviewing it and doing it. So that's why usually there's an upfront fee. And then the subscription fee then is a monthly fee. You can cancel it like usually within 30 day notice. If they want to raise the fee ever, they have to give you notice, resign a contract. But that's a more affordable way. So let's just say they charge you $750 to set it up. And they charge you $150 a month. Yeah, because the most of the work is going to be in the initial setup and the maintenance is a little bit less, you know, when it comes to hourly hours that you're putting in. Correct. So some months you're going to do a little bit less and other months you're going to put a lot in and it averages it out. Mm-hmm. So what's nice about that kind of relationship billing is that you're not doing the plan and then talking to the client three years later, you know, when they want to update the plan, you know, it's an ongoing relationship. So when Somebody has to make a tough decision, you know, something stupid, like buying a car. Should I buy it? Should I lease it? I'd say, I get that question every month. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of emotional questions like about ownership of a car. Do you like get one every couple of years? Do you want trade in? What's the interest rates? You know, what's the residual value? We, We start doing analysis work to figure out what's the best financial decision and what's the emotional decision. Right. And can you afford to take the emotional decision? <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. So, I mean, sometimes it's a bad financial decision, but you can afford that bad financial decision if it makes you happy. All right. And other times you can't afford to make that decision. Everything's a trade-off. Got it. Yeah. But it's an ongoing relationship and you get to know the client more and understand um, their goals and where they want to go when you're talking to them on a regular basis. You know, you're going to be talking a couple times a year and updating the plan and it's nice when you don't have to fix a client's mistake. The person I told you who came to my office earlier this week who wanted to retire early, mm-hmm. and I told her to work another two years because of medical insurance and so forth, she ended up, and it came from a referral from a, um, an accountant who happened, and it's funny because this client was actually my tax client before I saw my tax practice uh-huh, that's in funny. 2011. So it was, it was quite a few years um, since I seen her, but- she at the end of the meeting, she goes, how much do I owe you for today? We were there probably for an hour and a half. So you don't owe me anything today. 
And she goes, why? You spent a lot of time with me. I said, I'd rather correct a mistake now than when you become a client two years from now and I have to fix a problem you made two years ago. Makes my job a much easier now. <laughs> fix the mistake before it happens as opposed to after, right? Yeah. So we usually give a complimentary meeting. Usually you don't give advice, you know, but this was someone I knew. I, I, you know, I had the accountant on the Zoom call. We were all looking at each other and it was the right advice to give her. I mean, I could have probably tried to sell our financial plan at the time, but there was no value I was going to give her, mm -hmm. which I already gave her, you know, just to do a plan and charge her just to show what I already knew wasn't worth it. So just doing the right thing, you know, when you're doing these financial plans and you know, usually when the client comes to you, they, they, they're usually asking for help for on something. Right. The other thing is um, a lot of people don't realize is you don't have to hire a financial planner to do a financial plan. Hmm. So I get people will call me and say, hey, I know you're working with Joe Schmo down the street. He told me that I should call you before I buy this life insurance policy. They're recommending this whole life policy. The premium's $8,000 a year for this amount of death benefit. And I wanted a second opinion. Okay. You know what? I can do some life insurance analysis independently. And, you know, I, I'll charge you probably three, $400 for the work, depending on how much work's involved. And I'll be able to tell you one, if you need that amount of insurance, do you need a whole life policy? And is that the best company to go with? Right. And I'm not looking to make the sale. I'm doing it as an independent person to give advice. So I'm not looking to try to get that leverage. It's not my line of work I do. Yeah. I'd rather that person close the deal and they know that I endorsed it, so they refer me business. Sure. So it's a peace of mind. Like when you're going to commit to $8,000 a year to protect your family, you want to make sure that's the right thing to do. For sure, yeah. You know, I see a lot of insurance sales which aren't um, appropriate, un unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the other thing is, what I find is a lot of people have most of their investments in their 401k. Mm-hmm. And if you think about it, you're managing your own 401k. So at some point, you may not feel comfortable what you're doing. So you want a second opinion mm -hmm. where they have another investment advisor and they don't know if they're great or not. They're just making assumptions that they're doing their job and they just want a second opinion. And there's many times where I review an outside investment account and I tell them they're doing a good job based on your risk, your goals, you know. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. It may not be the exact way I'm doing. I would do it, but it's, they're doing a good job and they're doing it their way and it's going to work for them and the client. So that's okay. And people like that. They'd like to have that reassurance that, you know, my advisor is doing the right thing because we all hear these horrible stories about advisors. Oh yeah. Too risky. They took all these risks in these penny stocks. They lost money or they stole the money like Bernie Madoff. So they like to have that second set of eyes just to make sure everything's okay. So Rich, you can work with a client on a particular issue as you've kind of uh, illustrated here. What about comprehensive planning? What does that consist of? I guess to understand what comprehensive planning, you have to know what goal-based planning is first. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, and, and now there's a new term called holistic planning. So goal planning is a very simple financial plan. It's usually goal-based, that's why it's called goal-based planning. Right, yep. So you pick a category, let's say retirement planning. We want to know that if we save this amount of money, we have this much money, we save this amount of money every year, what's that going to look like projected with a rate of return and then with a withdrawal rate? Got it. Usually when you look at the reports, if you're 45, the report's not going to start to your 65 yeah. or 67, depending on when you start retirement. Right. So you don't see any of the numbers in between from 45 to 67. All right. So it's making all these assumptions. Yeah. And then- it's usually a short report, and there's not much planning we do in a goal-based plan. We just plop numbers in, what you have, what your savings rates are, what type of accounts, IRAs, non-qualified, blah, blah, blah. So then it spits out a report. I'm not a big fan of those. You can go online to a free website and find those. Plug, just plug the numbers in the calculator, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, you could probably do it on Excel if you can do a, <laughs> some time value calculations. Right. I like to... Um, do what we call comprehensive planning or cash flow planning. Okay. Which takes every single dollar from the time we work together. So 2021, we would start in April, 2021, the plan would start. Yep. And it takes every single dollar in consideration. Okay. So I need to know what your expenses are right now. On a goal-based plan, I don't really care what your expenses are right now. I care about it when you're retired, what you need to live on. 
So to maximize your retirement, I can't do that with a goal because I don't know if there's surplus money and how you're saving it appropriately and so forth. So cash flow planning is taking every single dollar consideration from the day you start the plan and it allows me to do tax strategies. So now I can say, hmm, I got taxable accounts, I got IRAs. The client is concerned about their income needs, not so concerned about their um, children's inheritance. So maybe what we're going to do is we're going to do a strategy to um, keep the tax rates low during the retirement years on distribution. So maybe we can make some of that Social Security not taxed. Yeah. You know, and we'll take a little less out of the qualified accounts, which the children can go ahead and pay taxes on. So with the cash flow, there's a lot more planning you can do for taxes, on strategies. And that's the same for every topic within a comprehensive financial plan. There's life insurance, there's disability insurance, there's estate planning. You know, I can just, I mean, we'll talk about all the, I mean, I can keep going right now. What are some of the common topics you create uh, a plan for? I mentioned a holistic financial planning. That's the same thing pretty much as comprehensive planning. It just sounds better for marketing. Yes, it's a buzzword. But comprehensive planning, holistic planning, what it involves is these particular topics. Normally, what you want to do is you want to talk to your client and document a plan for retirement savings. How much money do you need to save to get to retirement? Retirement distribution, let's say now you're retired, how do you want to take your money out? You know, are you concerned about maximizing your cash flow? Are you worried about Uncle Sam? Are you worried about your children? Things like that. Knowing how to take money out from Different type of um, registration of accounts, like the IRAs, non-IRAs, is very important. Yes. Very, very important. That's a big issue right now in our industry that we're, we keep talking about that with our clients. Um, investment review and allocation, what was good two years ago may not be good today. Sure. More important, when you were 30 when you started your 401k, now you're 65, is probably not the same allocation you want to be in. Agreed. You know, sometimes you can take too much risk and not get rewarded for that risk. Indeed. So, you know, we want to weigh out the risk and the return. And more important, we want to make sure we're taking the, the right amount of risk to the goal we need to fund. Uh, big one is tax planning. I do a lot of the tax planning uh, for my clients, especially having a tax practice in the past. I'm very sensitive to um, taxes and the investments. It's kind of embarrassing if I cause an unexpected tax consequence for the client. Yes. <laughs> So can't really do that. So most of my clients actually probably started off as a tax client of mine at one point. Uh, insurance planning, that could be for life insurance, disability, home, car insurance. And here's a big one which surprises me is umbrella insurance. How many people don't have that? It's so inexpensive and God forbid something happens, you need it. So umbrella insurance is excess insurance. Mm -hmm. You get one for like $2 million, about 300 bucks a year. Right. For those who don't, have it, call their insurance agent, talk about it, find out if you need it. Um, if they own a business, you know, that's a big one right now. A lot of business owners always feel like they can't sell their business when they retire, that no one could do as good of a job as them. Yeah. You know, when I came from the a bigger tax um, firm, that was always a thing. And we always told them every business is sellable. Right. You might be a key factor to that business, but through a, a proper transition of selling the business, you know, it's, so, it's sellable. But more importantly, with the tax code changes constantly, you know, like right now with Biden being president, there's a lot of things we're looking at, accountants in particular, are looking at to see if businesses need to recharacterize. Like, does it make sense to be an LLC to go to an S Corp? Right. You know, if Biden increases the FICA tax for people making over 400000 you're going to see LLCs go to S Corps, take W-2 income up to like 250000 300000 take dividends not subject to the FICA tax. So, you know, there's business planning, too, on how you structure your business and your expenses and your depreciation and when you're going to sell and all that kind of fun Absolutely, stuff. Absolutely, yeah. So that's a big one right there. Estate planning is going to be big, especially with the new IRA distribution rules for beneficiaries. Now you get to um, liquidate um, an IRA when you inherit non-spouse, of course. Within 10 years of the death, there's a lot of planning strategies for that. Education planning being, you know, for middle school, high school, all the way up to college and, you know, master's degrees and PhD. Mm -hmm. um, big one is the budgeting and savings. You know, it's interesting. My, I, I don't think I've ever, until like the last two years, I, I think the last time I sat down to work on a budget with a, it wasn't even a client, it was a friend of mine mm -hmm. who, you know, was trying to be responsible and needed help. And, you know, just the way he thought, and I had to bring back the old envelope trick. 
Like you put your money in the envelope and this is what you spend. Yep, when your yep, envelope's yep. empty, you're done. Mm-hmm. But that is now becoming a lot more um, common. People coming to me for help with the budgeting. You know, if you properly budget, then you can um, save more. Yes. And if you can save more, you have options, maybe putting into a qualified retirement account, lower your tax rates, things like that. Another big issue, you know, this other advisor, Eric, you know, he's younger than I. And when he did financial planning, he was really focused on debt planning, like, you know, people, credit card, school loans and things like that. Sure. And we were always arguing which financial planning software to use because the one he was using had a really strong planning for debt and mine didn't, but mine was like everything else was better. (laughs) So I remember saying to him, I go, hey, Eric, here's a really easy solution. Stop getting clients with debt and maybe get clients with money. (laughs) (laughs) Man, you guys always just rip on each other all the time. But you know what? Fast forward, I just did a credit card payoff plan for someone, you know, now that, you know, I don't need a financial plan to do it. There's other software I could pay for to do it. But, you know, there's strategies like you have a credit card debt and you think you're never going to get out of it. And there's a way to structure the payments based on your balance, minimum payments and interest rates on how much more, like when you have excess money within the minimum, which one you should apply for it first. And then taking when that one's paid off, take that money and put the next. Yep, yep. So there's usually like two major strategies. One is um, snowball strategy, right? There you go. Do I want to pay off as quick as possible or do I want it to pay the least amount of interest? Yeah. Those are the two strategies. And, you know, I had a client just recently. Um, she's preparing for a divorce and they have a lot of credit card debt. Good thing is that she makes a lot of money. And when you look at the credit card statements and it says like if you continue paying this, how many years it's going to take out? Oh, yeah. And she was freaking out. I said, don't freak out. Let's sit down. Until you see it in writing, a plan, you're never going to feel comfortable with debt. Right. That's a good point. When we documented, we put everything in, we spit out a report. And she was like, oh, my God, I can do this. Yeah. I said, I know. (laughs) I know you can. Trust the professional. I said, but you will always feel nervous until you see it on paper and, you know, that it'll work. That's human nature. Yep. So those are the the biggest items in a financial plan. But again, I think doing the subscription-based planning, it gives you another level of planning. It allows the client to call and ask questions about buying leasing. Yeah. We're we're having a wedding. Soon we have to plan for, you know, they want this, you know, to help with some of the planning for like one-off things and, you know, things like that. Or, hey, my my son got in a little trouble and I want to make sure that we're protected you know, for his stupidity, <laughs> you know, things like that. Or daughter. Let's not, let's not, uh, it could be a daughter too. Well, think about me. Like I told you in the beginning of the podcast, my son's doing racing and I'm thinking to myself, God forbid, he's in an accident and kills someone. Sure. You know, I don't think it's likely it's going to happen, but I don't want to lose everything I saved for and built because of a simple accident in a sport where everyone knows the risks. Right. So looking into that and planning for that risk was really important for my wife and I. I think as we wrap up here, Rich, the big takeaway is that, you know, this idea of financial planning, there used to be this stereotype that it was only for the super rich who had to worry about, you know, passing money on to their heirs and tax loopholes and all these other things. But financial planning is something that is very affordable for the vast majority of people. And there are different ways to do it. And I think it's really important uh, for people just to think about hiring someone like you to do something like this. And if someone wants to get a hold of you, Rich, at New Century, what are the best ways to do it? In my previous podcast, I've always said, if you work with another advisor, I respect that. I, you know, that's great. Hopefully you're more educated. You know um, what kind of questions to ask. If you're doing it yourself, same thing. If you don't have an advisor and you want to talk to one, call me. Give me that opportunity. This is the one time I'm going to say, call me. Yes. Because there are a lot of people who will say they'll do a financial plan. You know, their main business is investment advising. But they don't want to lose that investment client because they can't do a financial plan. Right. They're worried about that. So they, they might do one plan a year, two plans a year. And I wouldn't want anyone to go to them. Not, you know, out of fairness, they might do a great job. But just statistically saying, the more plans you do, the probably the better you are, better you're keeping up with the, the state planning laws, the tax laws and things like that. So this is the first time I'm going to say, call me if you want a financial plan. I can tell you right off the bat if I can help you or not, if it's worth getting one. Mm -hmm. 
if you live locally to one of my advisors in my group, you know, we have um, advisors throughout the country. I'll introduce you to them if you want to work with someone locally. If not, you know, I work on Zoom all day long, even before COVID. Yes. So call me, you know, mention the podcast. You know, I have room for upfront fees on the subscription plans. You know, just mention that you're a listener of the podcast. Call me at 609-924-2049. If you don't want to call me, you can always uh, reach me through email at R-O-R-I-N-G at ncfg.com. If you're busy and you want to play phone tag, on my website at www.ncfg.com, you can just go to contact us and there's a tab under contact us to schedule as my online calendar. Just schedule some time. Let's have a talk. I think I can help ncfg.com it's new century financial group we're going to link all of rich's contact in the show notes really important and informative stuff today rich always a pleasure to be with you thank you jack richard Waring's branch office is one airport place princeton new jersey 08540 the branch phone number is 609-924-2049 securities offered through royal alliance associates inc member finra sipc advisory services offered through new century financial group llc a registered investment advisor not affiliated with Royal Alliance Associates, Inc. New Century Financial Group, LLC, and Royal Alliance Associates, Inc. does not offer tax advice or tax services. Please consult your tax specialist for individual advice. We make no specific comments or recommendations on any tax-related details.